So, hi. <coughs> Let me start this with a question. So, how many of you are know, uh, know about Docker or Kubernetes? Raise your hands, please. Ah, many. And how many of you are using it in production? Make a Spock. Spock. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, let me first introduce Quantlane. We are a technological company. Uh, we are trading stocks uh, on different stock exchanges around Europe. Um, we are based in Prague. Uh, we have a relatively small team of developers. There is uh, 13 of us. Um, as I said, we are developing a trading platform, which we are also using. We are not selling it outside. Um, and we use mostly open source projects to run our infrastructure. And even our, most of our code uh, uses open source project, projects. So, um, our trading platform uh, is written in Python, obviously. Uh, it uses uh, React.js for front-end. Uh, in our applications, even in our trading platforms, we heavily used async.io because uh, there's a lot of data and we want to process it in parallel, oh, yeah. Con concurrently, excuse me. Uh, and we are storing data in Redis and Timescale DB. So, um, also we are using third-party libraries, uh, integrating, it, integrating them with Cyton. Um, those libraries are written in C, C++, Java, or even Scala. So, Cyton, hooray. <laughs> Um, so um, there are lots, there are a lot of data. So we have to split our application into multiple processes, and also there are uh, applications around which help us. Like uh, there's reporting, some graph, graphs, uh, and other tools we use. Also, we are using messaging to integrate all these applications together and pass data from one to another. So, when I st first started working for Quantlane, there was kind of a chaos. Uh, all the applications were deployed on physical servers uh, managed by Circus, Circus D. Um, it is process management system uh, similar to Supervisor D, if you know. Uh, packages were installed in virtual env, so each application had a separate virtual env uh, with installed uh, pre-installed packages, probably the standard, and everything ran on the single user. So, pros of this uh, pros of this were that it was simple. Um, it was simple in a manner that uh, when a new user came to the project, all he had to do was Clone project, create virtual env, install packages, and he could run run the application. This, it was the same for the deployment. There were some disadvantages, like there was some package versioning hell, uh, which means that uh, we had uh, different packages, and whenever we updated one of our own packages, uh, it may use some newer third-party libraries and we had to somehow um, migrate those changes into our other applications. And there was no failover because when the server died, everything on it died and the workload was not automatically migrated somewhere else. So. What happened next was Docker. Uh, when I started, uh, we are al already looking into the use of Docker. As it was, uh, yes, it has a promising features like uh, it was able to unify a, in our environment so that we could run the local development with the same kind of package, let's say image, as it was in staging, CI, and the, then in production. The deployment was also simple because all you had to do was build an Im build the image, just run one command, and you had probably running application. Migrations were also simplified, uh, as 
the image contain everything. You don't you don't have to um, install anything else. Just pull the image and you have it. Uh, it's speed up our CI in a manner that image uh, when we build them build. When the image is built, it contains everything, so we can use this image through all the uh, through all the other stages of CI. So, and we have atomic releases as the built image has some tag and even some hash. So uh, we can we have uh, image with a, we have image with a hash, which is atomic and unique in our registry. So, uh, so there are some there are some, uh, there were some challenges we had to overcome first to introduce Docker to our infrastructure, and those were like how do we store the images? For this case, we decided to use uh, GitLab registry, as we already had a GitLab instance in our infrastructure and it had this feature. Um, Next thing was image caching because uh, it's kind of sad, but we have a pretty slow uplink to the internet. Like our internal network is fast; it it is it has a gigabit, but uplink is around 20 megabits maybe. <laughs> so not much. Oh. So as I said, we are using GitLab, and uh, GitLab has CI which. Uh, has steps defined in the Git repository. So anybody who has access to Git, repo Git repository uh, can update the pipeline definition and modify it to whatever he wants. Um, as we wanted to have a, a build stage in CI, like the simple uh, CI build is this. You just run Docker build and it should build the image and prepare everything. But uh, as a user has access to uh, CI definition, he can update this and modify it maybe to something like this. Uh, and by this, he can effectively get access to the server on which the Docker daemon is running. This means that uh, you should have a dedicated building environment which you can just take and throw out, replace it with a new one clean. So whenever uh, somebody get access to this environment and does something harmful to it, you can just clean it and go without any problem further. So next thing was CI pipeline design. Because you want to have fast CI. You don't want to spend 20 minutes on building and then testing and then maybe integration tests, publishing, whatever. And the last thing was cleaning, cleaning of old images. Uh, the standard Docker registry, which you can download from Docker Hub, uh, does not have uh, automatic cleanup of old images. And because our images have around 50, Oh, 500 megabytes, and we have like hundreds of them. We have we had to implement some kind of cleanup of these images. We are not uh, we are not running in AVS uh, in we are not only running in cloud, so we have uh, we don't have <coughs> infinite storage. So, uh, what Docker brought us was as I said, unified and stable environment by means that we had the same image for local development, CI, staging, and then production. And everything was baked in. So uh, developer, uh, when he built the image, he could be sure that uh, the packages which are in it and all the images, I don't mean all, just those which are specified in requirements, but also the third party requirements and the full chain will have the specified version. And this will be same in CI and staging and production. Uh, 
Be because of the Docker nature, when you build an image, it has everything packed in. So uh, the basic of this is to create one image, bake everything in, all, all the requirements, all the development requirements, uh, application, some environment specifics you need, and you can run everything in this image, as I will show you on the next slide. Um, it also brought us isolated environments. <laughs> By means that uh, when the application runs, it cannot access other applications running on the system. It cannot take uh, control over the other processes which are running there. And that's probably uh, some kind of security feature. So, fastest EI. And this is our spice. This is our pipeline. So first, we build the image. As I said, it contains everything. It contains all the packages, application, and some environment uh, definitions. Then next, we run tests, code quality, unit tests, packaging. Those are run inside this image in parallel. So each of those tests may run like maybe two minutes and this speeds up the entire process because in those state in this that stage uh, none of the jobs have to install the packages which was the bottleneck of our CI so uh, next we optionally deploy uh, next we optionally release a bleeding edge version and deploy it to staging and then we run integration tests and publish the documentation note that uh, Bleeding edge release and stage deployment to staging are optional, so we can run integration tests uh, immediately after the unit tests are complete. So uh, Docker has also some kind of uh, uh, Docker has also disadvantages, like there are known bugs, and every day you can find a new one. Uh, for example, there are memory leaks. There are some race conditions which lead to deadlocks. It has no failover if you don't use Docker Swarm. I don't know in what kind of state Docker Swarm right now is, but uh, also when the Docker daemon dies, uh, you cannot manipulate the running containers. Your containers may still be running, but you cannot stop them, restart them, or create new ones. There are a few gotchas uh, we found out when we started using Docker. And for example, there's a PID1 pitfall. Who knows about PID1 pitfall? Yeah. <laughs> Something you don't know. <laughs> nice. So PID1 pitfall is uh, basically a problem, uh, or maybe a feature, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when, when you run an application in Docker, it is started uh, with PID1. PID1 has a special meaning in, Lin in Linux because it is uh, an init process which starts everything like um, SSH, your uh, UI, whatever. Um, uh, PID1 doesn't inherit default, default signal handler handlers, which means that you have to implement them by, by yourself. Uh, who knows about the signal handlers in Linux? Okay, so. Uh, so you have to implement those signal handler, handlers because uh, you, you usually want a graceful, a graceful shutdown of your application. Um, so when you run docker command, uh, the process is started with PID1, and when you run docker stop on it, which should uh, terminate the process, the first what docker do is it sends sick term to it. If the application doesn't shut down in 10 seconds after this, it will send sick kill, effectively killing everything. You may lose your state with this. So it's a good idea to implement uh, the signal handlers. This also applies for a process which doesn't run outside of, uh, which runs outside of Python, 
outside of Docker. But uh, uh, also it has one other meaning that you have to, like the, when a process runs in Docker, you have to take care of the sub-processes you run. So if you are using sub-process uh, module and running other processes as a child processes, you have to terminate them and clean up after them. Because if you don't, they will remain there and uh, Docker will probably somehow take care of them or can or will kill, kill them at, at, at the end. So also we have to uh, take in mind the user within, a, within the container. Because uh, when somebody get access to your container and runs a shell in it, let's say some kind of attacker, so uh, the one can get the root access if you run your applications, your application on the root, which means that he can uh, modify the file system within it, even run other applications, and you should avoid this. You should avoid this because you don't want it to modify the uh, modify the entire container. He can even run uh, some kind of spam bot. You don't want that. Really. <laughs> After we migrated to Docker, it took around maybe a month, we started looking where to move next, and we found Kubernetes. It, can, it has some kind of uh, Navy item, like Docker has a whale, Kubernetes has a wheel. I don't know. So uh, what Kubernetes is, is basically a cluster orchestration. Um, this means that uh, you have a bunch of servers, you install Kubernetes on them, Kubernetes somehow manages all of them, and you just tell Kubernetes to run the application somewhere in the cluster, you don't care wha where, you just want to have it up running and maybe uh, accessible on some kind of ad address. So, um, what Kubernetes was interesting in what uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes was is interesting for us because uh, it solved some kind of failover when the server failed. So when a server in Kubernetes dies, it uh, migrates the work workload from the, that server somewhere else. So you don't have to care about it and you have, you can sleep at 3 a.m. It won't wake you up. Um, the configuration can be stored in namespaces. Namespaces are um, logical dividers. You can have namespace for production, for staging, even for different applications, maybe. Uh, namespace for uh, monitoring, logging, even your applications. And for each of these namespaces, you can have stored a global configuration, which can be then propagated uh, from this namespace to the services running in, in this uh, namespace. Also, it supports some kind of basic uh, service discovery. You can access other services based on DNS, like my service, my namespace service cluster local is the standard ad address. You just have to fill in with my service, my service and my namespace. It has an ingress controller. It supports an ingress controller. Ingress uh, is a way to expose the services, applications running in Kubernetes to outside world so the outside world can make requests and, uh, for example, uh, retrieve some kind of website which is running in Kubernetes. Um, the other way around, like uh, the services within Kubernetes can still access the outside world, but uh, for that outside world to access the Kubernetes services, you have to have an ingress controller. Also, um, Kubernetes has one fancy feature and that's deployment history, which means that when you deploy some kind of new service and it doesn't behave, you want to uh, revert it to previous version. So you can call kubectl rollout undo and this will um, deploy the previous version. So 
is a really uh, handsome utility when you want to simply uh, revert, revert something and you don't know which version, version it was running before. So, um, right now, we are in the process of migration to Kubernetes. Our main trading platform was already migrated a week ago. Uh, there are still other services which are running, running still uh, in Docker on other, other hosts, but we are planning to migrate them in maybe two weeks, and then we can uh, join all of the other servers into the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we have in uh, the environment uh, configured by namespace variables. So we have production namespace in which we have configuration um, for ser uh, which specifies where you can find services like uh, the messaging, some kind of uh, data storage, access to databases, and so on. And we are deploying our services using um, plain YAMLs with uh, Jinja2, like Jinja2 files containing YAMLs with variables. This allows us to have some conditionals in uh, templates and have a single deployment file which is adaptable for different uh, processes uh, or maybe profiles, configurations, and so. Uh, in this exam example, you can see that we have uh, some profile uh, specified and um, if the profile is Ctulu, uh, the other, there are other environment variables added to the deployment. So no, some not notable features about Kubernetes are probes. Imagine that you have web application and deploy it to Kubernetes. You want to check that it is running and if it starts like maybe 30 seconds, it's, you just don't want to care about it. You just deploy it and want to see it running as fast as possible. So uh, probes, what probes do, do is that they check if application is running by um, accessing the some kind of port you specify or running uh, some internal command within the container. This allows Kubernetes to check if the service is running and if it's healthy. If it's not, Kubernetes will automatically restart it. Uh, and then there are update strategies. Um, there are two major ones. One is rolling up update. Uh, what this strategy does is that when you deploy a new version, the old version is still running and new uh, new version, you know, new uh, deployment with new version is started, and unless the deployment with new version is uh, running, available, and stable, the previous version is the previous the previous deployment with old version is still running. So, when the second version, the new one, is available, the first one gets uh, shut uh, terminated. It's shut down, and all the traffic is forward, forwarded to the new deployment. Um, another s update strategy is recreate. Um, what it does is that it first shutdowns the previous version, then starts the new, and you can have some um, non-zero non downtime. Um, this update strategy is good when you have some kind of resource which has a uh, unique log, maybe um, you can have uh, some data stored in files and you don't want two applications to ac access the file simultaneously. <laughs> so, those were the fancy features or interesting features of Kubernetes. And uh, as I mentioned, Docker has whale, Kubernetes has uh, wheel, so beyond that, there are many wheels, so we are looking into the Kubernetes Federation next, and that's beyond. So, thank you. Any questions?
All right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Are these Jinja templates integrated somehow with Kubernetes configs and secrets for deployment? Uh, like uh, you can send only pure YAML files to Kubernetes and JSON files, but you can you can't send the YAML, uh, Jinja two files. So you first have to fill in the variables, then you can send it. And uh, the way our deployment is designed that. We take the Jinja file and fill in, fill in everything we have. So we have also secrets and config maps within the deployment. Uh, can I have one more? <laughs> mm, what, uh, which deployment strategy should I use if I have database migrations between versions? I, I should use this recreate uh, strategy, or there are some other better solutions? Uh, if you don't have any. Um, any way to fix, like to take care of the difference between those two versions, you have, you should use the recreate. But maybe there's a way, I don't know. How do you monitor all this? That's an excellent question. Um, we are monitoring uh, internal pods using Hipster, and we are monitoring uh, entire cluster by Prometheus. So previously you mentioned the fact that the problem of the PID1 within Docker, how that Kubernetes helped you? Kubernetes doesn't solve that. You have to solve this by yourself with, within your application. Okay, has been this solved and if so, how? Um, we are solving this by registering signal handler, which uh, as I mentioned, we are using async IO. So what do we basically do? We just stop the loop, which uh, terminates all the, um, all the running uh, futures. I think it's called futures. And uh, then we just have a finally block where we just uh, close all the handles, uh, states, uh, states uh, save the state, and clean up everything we need. But also, you can add a signal handler to loop, async I loop directly. Hi. Uh, do you have some uh, persistent data on hard drives, and how do you, do you manage this data between all the servers uh, that uh, you yeah. have? Yeah, uh, we had in it? we had a persistence on file system. We are right now migrating it to Redis, but uh, until now, what we had to do when we migrated between uh, hosts was that. We have to shut down the service, migrate the data, and start the service again. We have no shared storage. Okay. We have time for last question. At the beginning of the talk, you said that you were running the problems with uh, GitLab Runner. How did you solve the problem with, for uh, the clean environment for each pipeline? Uh, we have a dedicated uh, DIN, like Docker in Docker. So service running which which handles the uh, which handles the pipeline but uh, so we we uh, wait we have uh, we have shared we have shared shared dint but uh, when we are shutting down it sometimes so we clean it so basically uh, when that gets to dint it doesn't affect the entire host on which everything else is running so Actually, we have the same problem, and the problem with Deans is that you need to have a privileged container to run the Docker in Docker, and essentially you have a root if you if you do that. So, I wondered if you had mm. another solution. Yeah, maybe we didn't solve this the right way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we are, we are planning to migrate it to different hosts, to separate hosts, so maybe this will solve this. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Peter. Let's, thanks, uh, let's thank Peter for the next time talk.